I relate to the incels in in that I was a very shy young person and and I had all these weird like manifestations of shyness. For example, when I was like I think until I was 18 or 19, I was so ticklish that I couldn't be touched at all. So I thought I would never be allowed to to have sex with someone or make out with someone because I, I was different and this would get in, in the way. So I totally relate to that way of thinking. I felt that way. But I think if if I found a community of other people who felt that way, the way the incels have, like, I would stop feeling so different, and then I would no longer be so shy and ticklish, and I would probably find a nice boyfriend or some or a not nice boyfriend. So, like, why haven't they found, like, now that they have a community, why are they still incels? I think they're keeping it going. I think the vast majority of people who consider themselves incels are probably men. I know. So there's not a lot of sleeping around amongst them. But once you find your community, yeah. your self-esteem goes up and you can you could talk to each other about tips for like putting yourself out there or something. I don't know you super well, but I, I suspect you're the kind of person who internalizes these things. Yeah, right? I, mean, I think incel, like, doesn't that come from internalizing like what they suffer from? I think it starts off that way. Yeah. But then but then I think they become sort of like super aggressive and they blame the world outside of them. That's so, the part I don't get. Like yeah. the in, the original incel part, I totally get. I heard the word was coined by a woman, a queer woman who couldn't mm-hmm. find like lesbians around her or something. Yeah. Do you know about this? Yeah. And, Did yeah, I learn this from you on a Facebook post or something? I don't think so. Okay. But I, I, I'm sure that we both read that same. Yeah. I, I think we probably read all the same articles. Yeah. <laughs> they sort of cycle around between our like 20 friends. Do you, I don't read Facebook that much anymore. I read a lot of Instagram. The approach is different. I don't think it's healthy to necessarily internalize everything, but there's a marked benefit of that in that you can sort of potentially see these things in yourself and hopefully address them. Yeah. If you're, if you internalize, you can cure things that are hurting you by finding other people like you. And I guess if you put things outward, it seems from the incels that you can't cure the thing anymore. It just gets worse. When did you become more social? 23. I want to say I met you at a party, so you we were, met at a party. You were already like a butterfly at that point. I was a butterfly. We met at a Rob Sikoriak party. Yeah, New Year's party. Although you were the one person I talked to at that party, I went into the party. I think I walked right back out. I got a drink. I might have met you. I don't think I'd met you yet. I walked right back out. Then I thought this party's so far from where I live, and I walked right back in again. Oh, as in it would just like take you too long to get home that it wasn't worth it. Yeah, like I had traveled like an hour to get to this party i walked in i didn't know yeah i didn't wreck i didn't know anyone i had a drink i I left i went outside and then i came back in again because i felt stupid if the party was like 10 or 15 minutes away you would have just gone home i think so and i think now i would just go home because i don't have that chip on my shoulder anymore of thinking that i'm very awkward i have more confidence now so if a party's bad i'm more likely to blame the party like an insult it wasn't a bad party though. no it was a great party but i didn't know anyone there yeah you go to something like that hoping that you'll see somebody you know and then that will spur on a conversation hopefully you'll meet some people from there yeah i think the ideal party you know one out of ten people one out of five people i know bob sikoriak better now so in that in and of itself will make makes his parties completely worth going to but i don't yeah. I don't know if I'd even met him at that point. I couldn't, I didn't even feel comfortable introducing myself to him. Is it just pure anxiety? No. I have that problem at parties. I have certain extroverted tendencies where, you know, I get on a microphone and talk to strangers or like go on TV and all these things. But like if I go to a party where I don't know anyone, I get it's like super anxious. Yeah. No, I love being at a party where I don't know anyone, but maybe not as much as I love like being at doors alone. Like it's not, yeah. it's not terrifying. I just thought, oh, I don't know anyone. It's not likely I'll in- insinuate myself into a conversation I want to be in. So I saw it. It was fine. I'll leave now. You don't feel like this is an interesting party, likely with interesting people. No, I don't want to meet new people. That's you don't the other meet thing. New people. No. Why not? I have like 600 friends, I want to say. Okay. And it's enough. It's like that thing on Facebook where you can't add any more people. You're like, yeah. one friend will have to leave the fold. Yeah. And then you can add someone from there. I don't even recognize my friends' faces anymore. It's too many people. You've been incredibly busy lately. We've been, you know, we've been trying to like set yeah. something up for a while. Yeah. Is this all just prep for the book? Yeah. I'm doing a, my, I have a really great publicity team now and I'm doing a lot of interviews. So that's why I'm busy now. I'm always busy for a different reason, but it's a social busy now. Have you gotten comfortable doing interviews, talking about the book? 
Yeah, I love public speaking. Have you always? Yeah, since I started being able to speak at all, which is like my mid 20s. So you went from not being able to speak and to, to just completely embracing public speaking? No, I could speak. I just couldn't. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I know you could speak. <laughs> I, I'm not suggesting that like you didn't have the capacity to speak, but from just not engaging yeah. in people to just sort of like leaning into it. Yeah, I couldn't make small talk. I think public speaking is a very concrete form of small talk where you know the reason that you're talking. And I think those like limits and and rules are comforting to me. You've got a very clear purpose when you're doing that. Yeah. Whereas when you go to a party, you're kind of just sort of grasping at maybe some sort of common thread that you have with this person. Yeah. Also, like what we're doing now, I know you're asking me questions and those are the rules and I don't have to remember your family's names and ask you <laughs> how they are and your rabbit, Lucy. And she's, which, she's doing how well. How's she doing? She's, she's good. I can't believe it. You're a very good pet owner. But yeah, I think like public speak, if you're giving a talk, you're talking. Yeah. It's not a give and take, and that's simpler in some ways. What was the block? You clearly don't have a problem talking about some like pretty personal issues. No, I do have trouble talking about other people's personal issues. Though. Yeah. I'm very nervous about crossing some line of other people's privacy. As far as asking them questions? Yeah, or... getting interviewed so much. I don't I don't understand how someone can give an interview. It seems so hard. It's like the, a tactful art. How did you sort of cross that threshold? Was it just like being asked to do enough of these events that you started to enjoy it? I'm trying to remember. I don't know. I think the ticklishness went away the first when I first had a boyfriend. So it just like like vanished and i think the terror of small talk was similar like i i still have it when i'm startled i can't remember any words that i need i can't remember people's names i can't remember nouns and it's this terror and i used to have that whenever i tried to speak especially to someone i didn't know very well or or like in front of a class i couldn't i just couldn't remember enough words to get anything out of my mouth but i think oh yeah it was drinking <laughs> oh that's fair <laughs> I had a drink the first time I gave a talk, and it was fine after that. Bef I think before I gave my first talk, I couldn't do a job interview. I couldn't do a presentation. I, I used to break down crying when I tried to do a job interview. There's pieces of the of this in the book, and obviously, like it's sort of it's hard to figure out where the line is drawn between this actually being memoir. Clearly, there are a lot of fantastical elements in there as well, but there's kind of a sense of thanks for reading it. Of course, but there is a sense of solitude and and an kind of an inability to obviously sort of like socialize outside of the house. Does that sort of get to the heart of the, of these issues that you had up until your your twenties? Yeah. I was very shy. I had no trouble talking to my parents and, I, and my brother, and I think I didn't have trouble with eye contact with them. But anyone else, it just, it was so terrifying and it was kind of isolating. We lived in the country and my school was in, in a suburb kind of far away. So the books about how I drew this, there, there was this line between my home life and my school life. And the home life was this magical world that my mom built for my family, she had been an architect before she married my dad, and her swan song was this this um, modernist house that was like with, curved, yeah, curved house, yeah, with a point on top in the country. And she quit her job because my dad was a doctor, and his practice was too far from the city for her to commute and and be an architect. But she she poured all her art and magic into our childhood, and she also became a painter. And it was this very private form of art making and not not a career form and then so the private world was so magical for me and then the public world of being in school was so alienating and and strange and it's almost like just like some weird robot worlds that didn't really exist that I had to spend my time in during the day why was it so isolating was it just the fact that your home life was so geographically physically far removed from it I think I would have been forced to leave my strangeness if we'd lived closer and there were kids knocking on my door all the time. Yeah. But I think it probably was something I wondered if I was autistic as a kid a, a tiny bit. I don't use that label now, but I think there was some brain wiring thing that made me different that didn't get beaten out of me until I was in my 20s. Why don't you use that labeling? Uh, why don't I use it? Do you feel like what we know about it, that that is sort of an accurate representation of, of you? Uh, I think it could have been when I was a kid, if I'd been in a, a zealously labeling family, I could have been labeled and maybe it would have been helpful back when I couldn't 
make eye contact to to have a label, but I can make eye contact now and I have a lot of friends and and I've learned to do all the things that humans do. I just learned I learned it late and it seems kind of redundant to use the label now I don't need it anymore. I was describing her book to somebody. She was describing her family to me and then the I, I had, it my, had it in my backpack and it, it came up and there's a moment in there where it's your father throwing you up in the air, yeah, and he ma- and he's like makes eye contact and does he use the word term strangeness or something? It's something yeah. like that. I think I used the term strangeness. There's there's a all, each chapter of the book is a different. The the premise of the book is that I lost my shadow and I'm trying to figure out why I lost it and the different chapters of the book follow different reasons that I might have lost it and there one chapter focuses on my dad and that chapter says that I was a strange kid and I lost my shadow when I forced myself to stop being strange and the strangeness had some bad elements and some very wonderful elements and I draw a line between myself and my dad I say that he was also a strange person who really who hid it very very well and was very ashamed of his secret strangeness and kind of like slipped up for a second and forgot he was strange and while he slipped up he got married and had two kids and and when he sees that I was strange also he felt such immense guilt that he'd passed this sh- this shameful thing on to me it's almost like passing some like disease or something yeah. on your kid where it's this this thing that like he genuinely felt bad in, yeah. in New Knowing that like you wouldn't be able to fit in yeah. or pass. Yeah, I I don't feel that way about my strangeness if it's there. But and I don't think my dad actually feels strange. I've talked to him about it, but if he feels strange, I think there's a good chance that he's ashamed of it and mm-hmm. wouldn't admit it. That actual like moment in the book where you have him saying that was that was just based on your own projections? I do have a really early memory that when you're a really little kid, some of your memories get twisted in yeah. this weird way. So I have this weird memory of being thrown up in the air by a family mm-hmm. friend. And I remember staying up there forever and I don't remember landing. And I'm sure I did land. but And I think I probably really was thrown up in the air because people do that to yeah. babies. It wasn't my dad. Have they both read the book? Yeah. Have you discussed this concept with them? The the weirdness or the throwing yeah. in the air? No, no. The the weirdness when people are featured in books, they skip to themselves and yeah, they, they read those parts. I mean, they yeah. just sort of like want to see what somebody's saying about them. And I'm wondering what his reaction is because it sounds like you're not, you're still not entirely clear how he felt about all of this. The whole book was such loving stories of yeah. both of my parents, and I think I think my dad recognized that it was loving but also didn't relate to it and doesn't see himself the way I wrote about him. How would you classify this idea of strangeness? The early sort of social awkwardness was part of it? Two years ago I was on my on an autism kick and I would have called it mild autism two years ago. Mm. I think I don't remember if the if it's correct to say Asperger's now but I don't really know if there's a difference between Asperger's and mild autism. I'm not like a a monologuer but I have a feeling a girl with Asperger's wouldn't fit into the stereotype of the boy who talks about math in a monotone. But maybe maybe she would, and I don't have that. Right now I say I have sensory differences, which means I'm like very easily startled and I get overwhelmed very easily. And that could explain like why I couldn't talk. Like maybe I could have talked to a person, but I couldn't be in a class full of 30 people doing different things eight hours a day. Like I would just shut down, which I I think I did. And that's why I couldn't talk. I don't think my dad is easily overwhelmed, but I do hear that he couldn't, he didn't talk as a kid. He's reserved. He sees things in an unusual way. I don't think he likes to be touched. He's, he's like in no way an Asperger's y like math person. He's not, he's not nerdy. He keeps his own counsel in a certain way. And I see bits of myself in him and think I might have inherited something from him and, and kind of magnified it. This seems to be largely self diagnosed. Yeah. Have you talked to a professional about any of this? No, why would I? I mean, I think I should have when I was a kid, but I don't need to people anymore. People like to have these like, insights. Like People like to know why they are the way they are. Yeah, but why would a psychologist know better than I know? You've clearly worked through any issues that you might have had. No, I don't want professional help. And I don't know if I would be diagnosed or not, but like... I think if I were diagnosed, that would be stupid because it would just be my new weird hobby. You'd be obsessed with it? Yeah. yeah. Well, I I wouldn't, but I think the only reason I'd want to be diagnosed now would be to be obsessed with it and talk about it to people. I have bad 
circulatory system. I could talk about that. Do you feel that it's tied to your creativity? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think I see things in an unusual way. I think I pinpoint details. That's another reason I I used to self-diagnose as autistic. I guess another reason I don't call myself mildly autistic is that I haven't seen a professional and I think it's not PC to self-diagnose. But people with different neurological issues sometimes look at details instead of at the big picture. And people with mild autism are bad at recognizing faces, but they're very good at recognizing, like, let's say noses. So I think I have that. And I think a lot of my, where my cartoons come from is noticing details that jump out at me that don't jump out at other people. And it's at the expense of not really getting the big picture as much as other people do. Does that play a role in the storytelling as well and your ability to kind of distill moments into a panel or or a page? Yeah. I'm not sure, but I think I'm a good cartoonist (laughs) who like notices detail, but, and also a very bad storyteller. Like I don't, I don't naturally link link little details into a bigger narrative, and that's part of why the book has such a postmodern structure to it. It stops and starts, and there's, yeah. it's very meta, and you're crumpling up pages. Yeah, it's told in a series of chapter ones, although that really was... I think a self-confidence issue too. I really did keep starting the book and and then thinking I can't continue and I need to start over. But I think that was more from not thinking I'd be able to sell it and thinking Mm -hmm. I'd be very poor and need to find a new way to make a living rather than really having trouble with narrative. So are those stops and starts, those are actually moments where you were stopping and starting in the writing of the book? Yeah, it's very literal. You didn't actually crumble anything up and throw it out because you did come out the other side with a book. I'm always crumpling stuff up, but I ha- I scan it first. When I used to have a rabbit, I used to throw things on the floor for him to eat. Including pages of your yeah, work? Yeah, oh. pages. He would eat He would eat your pages? Yeah. Is that a, That's not good, is it? Uh, no, it's probably. The book actually started off as another project. You were trying to adapt a Nabokov book. Yeah. I was trying to adapt a book called The Real Life of Sebastian Knight. That's a Nabokov novel into a comic. I mean, that's a pretty grandiose thing to attempt, right? I mean, he's like yeah. one of the great writers. Well, it's a big project, but I think in a funny way, a big project is easier than a smaller project because once you get into it, I think with the low self-confidence, it's so hard for me to get into a project. I, I just like beat myself up like, why does this need to be done? Don't do this project. And then I have nothing to do and I get fidgety. So If you have a big project, you only have to ask that at the beginning, and then you can just work on it in peace. And also, if it's someone else's novel, you're not like, oh, this doesn't need to exist. The flip side of that, though, is why does this need to exist? It didn't. It didn't need to exist. I was... That, like, you were just looking for a project. Yeah, I was just looking for a project, and I thought this was something I could convince an editor mm-hmm. to be interested in. When I when I I didn't believe I could convince an editor to be interested in me, which is pretty reasonable. I was yeah. young, but also I also just felt like such a backstabber because I really love Nabokov. I really don't think it's cool to adapt written things into graphic novels all the time. I think you need a really good reason. I'm sure between us, we've probably read read millions of really bad autobiographical comics and ones that maybe felt like they didn't necessarily need to exist. Yeah, that's true. Although I really love a lot of them. I think that's kind of an easy form where it doesn't need to be fireworks. It's just interesting, whatever it is. But I really hate when people draw Face, facial expressions always the same and faces always the same. So those are the ones I don't like. Was there a sense that maybe your story, your own life didn't necessarily warrant that you would have difficulty getting people interested in it? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, the I think I love diary comics, but I don't love... I think a, mem- a memoir has to be have a nice shape to it and have a meaning to it. Diary comics, there's almost something nice in the banality of it. Yeah, exactly. They're just... You can't do it wrong if you can do it at all but i don't think most people can do it at all you recognize that your youth was an unusual one i do now that i wrote the book i still don't think i don't think of it as a memoir really i think of it as almost a universal story i think a memoir is about an unusual youth and i think mine's kind of a fairy tale like i distilled my family life so that it could have been anyone. Just being a fairy tale is obviously, allegorically, maybe there are things that people can attach themselves to, but there are, there are certainly certain elements that come out of reality that lend themselves to a fairy tale that are, are less universal, like yeah. 
the, the shadow the thing, the house. Yeah. Yeah. I still think I had, I don't know. I don't think I had a very unusual childhood. I do think I had, I think my mom like tried to give me a magical childhood. I don't know if that's unusual. It's a total illusion and it's hard to grow up after that. And yeah. that's why this came out of the Nabokov story. Cause Everything Nabokov wrote was about his like magical childhood that he lost in St. Petersburg. And he wouldn't have been able to write about it as such a, a fairy tale if he hadn't lost it. And my mom is a huge Nabokov fan and both of us have are synesthetic and I and we both like that he was synesthetic, but I, I think more than that, I think he writes like a synesthete. I think people who cross their senses tend to be less less linear and he's mm. such a non-linear writer and I, it just feels so right to me what's an example of senses being crossed i see letters in color for instance it's not a life-changing thing i don't think that makes me see the world differently but i think it goes along with a certain like the way i see details how does that specifically kind of manifest itself in a book like this i don't know if i manifested it i don't i think i kind of repress that when i write mm. but someone like nabokov gets it and I wish there were more like him I think if everyone thought and wrote like that I would stop hiding it in myself he gosh there's so so many parts of it he doesn't write from point a to point b he writes like pointillistically and he can write like a throwaway metaphor like about the clock's mustache twitched or something which means the clock's like moving its hand yeah and then that could turn like that can switch from throwaway metaphor to to like something that actually moves the story along it's a good gateway into magical realism yeah I mean, when you're sort of blurring those lines yeah i think i see little things the same size as big things and i think i see um not literally metaphorically and i think i see metaphors and thoughts and ideas pretty concrete as if they're real and so that's there's not much of a difference for me between magic and realism. And I, I think Nabokov has that too. It's not even being imaginative. It's in a way like being unimaginative. He can't see something as just an idea. It's everything is real. Like his, his weird imaginary thoughts are completely concrete to him. That doesn't mean you can't like distinguish what is and isn't real. No, not at all. I don't see why we need to distinguish between them. The color thing is interesting because, you know, obviously you work in black and white. You work in ink and paper. Yeah. I have a great ability to judge color, I think, but I can't produce it. And I think Mm. that that's because I'm not really good at materials. I can't like saw wood and um, I can't paint neatly. I'm very messy. And I think some the kind of person who can do that knows how to gravitate towards the right paint and how to learn learn about the markers they love and I think I'm probably very picky and there is probably a marker out there that I love but I haven't like put in the time to Mm -hmm. finding it yet I think that's how you get to be a great colorist as a a kid or teenager whatever age you were when you discover somebody like Jules Pfeiffer I mean does that really does that free it up for you the the realization that you can be messy oh my god yeah he's he's a major one for me I never talk about him I think I keep him private it's quite clear looking at your work that he's a, he's a major influence everyone always says Quentin Blake like what when did you start drawing when when I was 10 months old I think okay when I was younger and I was very into drawing when you first start doing it you, you just try to kind of recreate things as lifelike as possible um, no no that's not that's you yeah, yeah. I, I think that's the experience that a lot of people have really I do you know, that's why, like, that's why tracing books exist. And that's why, like, yeah. how to draw cartoon character books exist. Yeah. That's what kids are checking out from the library because they want to, like, draw Fred Flintstone the way Fred Flintstone looks. I think my mom's snobbery is what kept me from doing that. She didn't let me trace and she didn't mm. let me copy. And she kept me far away from pop culture when I was a kid. When did you discover, like, a Jules Pfeiffer? Uh, I think when I was about 15, 14. I, I was so obsessed with him. Yeah, 15 or so. And that just, does does that kind of open up a world of potential for your own style? Well, no, I I didn't get Jules Pfeiffer until recently. Mm. I think the thing he has is confidence. I don't think it's a style. I think it's confidence. You can point out a Jules Pfeiffer drawing, like, you know, you know what it looks like. Yeah, but if he lost his confidence, he wouldn't draw like that anymore. He would draw way tighter. So you think being free like that requires confidence? Oh, yeah. I, I drew very slowly before... 
until a few years ago. What was the shift? I don't know. I think it was definitely confidence, but I think the confidence came from selling stuff, which meant that I had to produce it, make more stuff and try to sell it instead of drawing the same thing over and over. I think I think a lot of young artists have this idea that if they make one perfect thing, they'll be accepted into the world. And if they spend a year on one drawing and make it really perfect, they'll sell it and then they'll be a professional artist. Whereas I think the reality for better or for worse is that the more stuff you make, the more likely you are to sell various of them. Did you learn to be fast because you had bills to pay? No, I... Learn to be fast because I was running away from my perfectionism. In college, I would redraw everything a, mil- a million times. I think before I learned to to use a light box and started letting myself trace stuff, even though my mom doesn't believe in <laughs> tracing, like she really doesn't. She really hates it. Before that, I used to just draw the same lines over over and over on like a weird painting with like a draw something in ballpoint a million times and then when I ripped the paper I would like cut out the paper and glue it onto a new paper and then use like a slightly thicker pen and just like the same line and it looked so dead and I start when I started submitting cartoons I I retraced a billion times then I bought a Wacom Cintiq tablet and that's that makes things a lot easier you can erase the little bit you don't like and you're doing most of your drawing on a tablet no it was just a phase like I think that was the phase that got me from to stop being so perfectionist because when I really was able to make the line perfect I was like okay I'm capable of that and then I stopped doing it I think anger played into it when you're confident you stop turning all your hatred inward and you put it outward and and then you can make a very quick drawing of the thing you're angry about and for some reason you feel entitled to do that whereas if you hate yourself you don't feel entitled to draw at all unless it's perfect well now there are plenty of things to be angry about in yeah the world. i know it's very healthy <laughs> just is, kidding is it a sense of sort of catharsis for you is it like therapy a way of sort of channeling some of your issues with some of these problems into your work it was i was really angry for a few years at men yeah. mostly i think like in your life yeah well not The ones who are still in my life. Not, I was never angry at my dad and brother, but like, I think, like, when I was younger, I really felt so, I felt ignored, like an incel, and we, we don't really pay attention to, to women who feel ignored and like, like, oh, why does no one cat call me? I must be so ugly. Like, that's, Seen as a very not feminist way to think. I think we pay attention to men who feel ignored because they tend to lash out. Yeah. Right? I mean, especially now, like there's been a rash of violence. Yeah. But this gets back to what we were talking about earlier about the difference between internalizing and, and projecting. On Facebook, if some, if some like former model writes like, oh, I hate, or, or someone like me who's like gets catcalled and hates it because she has like a sweet face and looks like she'll answer. I don't know why, but like you'll write on Facebook like this man was so aggressive and terrifying and then I talked back to him and he almost punched me in the face or something, which is a real story that happened last week. But like if I were to write that on Facebook and then some 65-year-old woman were to comment, I miss getting cat called. Like all my friends would jump on her and be like, no, you don't. That's a horrible thing to say, Um, which it is because, yeah. But also that's how I felt when I was younger. Like I felt like no one would ever, ever, ever deign to pay attention to me. So because I felt that way, I got into a lot of weird situations with men. And like I ended up like I had I lived in a building with a doorman for a while. And he used to tell me he loved me whenever I walked in or out. I used to just like kind of smile at him because I was like, well, it's a it's attention. And I used to engage with everyone who wanted to talk to me and I ended up with dating very scary people I didn't want to date and this was a few years and then suddenly with confidence I was I looked back and I was like oh my god all these people have been taking advantage of me and I'm so angry and that anger lasted a couple years and was very cathartic and I don't need it anymore how much does the confidence come from work all of it yeah I think so. Of just sort of actually being able to put these things down on paper and putting them out in the world and like yeah. selling them and having people. Yeah. And Instagram makes me a lot more confident, like having this account with strangers who follow me and who who 
say that they relate to whatever I, I post, whether they actually do or not. It's so that's so cathartic. I think we're similar from the standpoint of my job is on the internet and it has been forever and I write a lot. So I'm able to sort of like get it out there and have that immediate interaction yeah. with people. Yeah. And then move on to the it's next so thing. It's so nice. Obviously, sitting down and writing a book is a very different experience. Yeah. I don't like it. You don't like it? I don't like it. I love being able to make a big thing, but I don't like doing it in a vacuum. I don't yeah. I don't understand why that's necessary. I mean, it must feel good now that it's sort of getting out into the world and people are reading it and are interacting with you. Yeah, I think my main goal for this book is to take in the confidence and, and feel like if I write, people will read it. Because mm -hmm. I didn't really have that when I was writing this book. But if I know that writing a book can reach people, maybe I'll... But I'll give my next book priority over the paid gigs that I do. You have confidence that people are reading the shorter things. You have confidence that people are reading things on Instagram. Yeah. But you don't know if that's necessarily going to translate into something longer. No. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I didn't read books while I was working on this. So mm. it was kind of hard to like ima imagine it reaching someone. Like I really, I don't know what it was, but I really couldn't read. I didn't want yeah. to. How long did it take to write the book? Six years. Six years to write, yeah. to write and draw? Well, six years. No, just six years to start and stop and, and throw out. You were doing other things in the meantime. Yeah. Like getting in six years. And like, especially when it turns into something that is introspective and is a memoir or, or diary or whatever we're calling it. How much in your own head do you feel during that time? So in my head. That's probably why I couldn't read. You were worried that it would influence it or you just couldn't derive no, pleasure from it? I couldn't concentrate on a page. Mm -hmm. And you were too wrapped up in your own work? No, <laughs> <laughs> not at all. I think I wasn't wrapped up in my own work at all. I couldn't, I couldn't like enter the story. It was too slow. And somehow not being able to enter my story made me not able to enter someone else's story. I think that might have been what it was. When 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 you're like constantly throwing things out, again, obviously some of them stuck around and, and you're able to put them together into a book. After you've moved past the point where you just completely hate something, what do you, what do you sort of identify? Like what makes it salvageable? Yeah, I think you hate something while you're working on mm. it, but you tend to be very gracious and like things if you're not working on them, whether you made them or, or you didn't make them. Once that sort of initial period is over you yeah. go back and look something you can yeah. realize the sort of the positives there yeah I think once I threw something out I would start to like it again the other thing is I love beginnings and I hate middles and ends so yeah. I think I really did enjoy making all those beginnings I just really didn't know how to continue any of them is there any point when you're drawing something that you do feel really confident that you do feel like it's worth keeping yeah I felt confident about the one chapter that was about my own childhood I think I wrote that as prose first mm. for some reading. I think the one time I agreed to do a story reading, like it was at KGB bar. I wrote that for the reading and it was so fun. And I think, I think part of why comics are so awful is that it's so slow to make them and you mm -hmm. can't, you can't like actually stay engaged with the idea you had long enough to, to finish it. So you have this spark of communicative joy and then you have to spend another two hours just like yeah. shading it in before if, you get to have your next idea. If you could write and draw it in the amount of time that it takes someone to read it, it yeah. would be a much different experience. Or even like, like three times slower, but not like a hundred times slower. Yeah. <laughs> so writing Writing that chapter as prose just made me feel so great. And I think the joy and I, I drew that chapter really fast. That was that's when I figured out the style that I drew the whole book in was when I drew that chapter out. I had a script for it. It was the only one I had a script for. And then knowing what you're saying helps you work faster. So then I, I think I went back and redid the other chapters in that style. If you have the impulse to, or it's part of your nature to really sort of second guess yourself, the fact that it, as you said, it takes a hundred times longer to write and draw it, that gives you a lot more opportunity to second guess what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. You're going over stuff over and over and over again. Yeah, exactly. When I was younger, when I was slower, I always really loved the initial idea of something and just couldn't keep it going. And mm. it that's kind of still my problem with comics. I think it would be a lot more natural to make short comics instead of book length comics. I've heard, I don't remember what like famous comics artist said that that's the natural size of a comic should be like a zine rather than a graphic novel. Yeah. 
or, you know, in your case, like Instagram of just sort of doing, yeah. it, doing it in the moment. Yeah, I think that's my natural, yeah. my, my natural speed. You came along at the right time that that's out there. I mean, do you feel like if you had come along at a time where something like Instagram wasn't around that you might not necessarily have kept at it? Yeah, I think I'd be like an incel living in a cave. I really do. What's sort of the most purely enjoyable part of the process of making comics for you? Oh, every part of making cartoons is enjoyable. I want that on the record. I talk to cartoonists who tell me this, and I talk to like musicians and all these people who are just like, I really enjoy it, but every single part is miserable. <laughs> no, I think that's long a long form thing. Like a writer or a comics artist, like having to sustain an yeah. idea for a long time is terrible. But like doing an Instagram cartoon is so fun. Just having an idea and then being able to express it is great and not having to even scan it, just photographing it with my phone. That's great. Comics, um, it's like waves that first it's horrible to get into the zone. Like you don't want to for whatever reason, like you keep walking around and buying coffee and Mm -hmm. it's like I could spend a whole day figuring out ways to not let myself start but then once I start if I'm coming up with an idea it's really it's really fun if I'm oh no I don't know I I think there's a sweet spot between not knowing what you're doing and just doing busy work that's really fun and it's not like I wrote a script the other day and that wasn't fun because I had no idea what I was what I was trying to say. And I, I knew I was just saying all these things that I was going to throw out later. But then I took the script and I refined it into a story. And that was just bliss. And I think ref- and then I think turning the story into a comic is also going to be bliss. But I think turning that comic into a beautiful thing that an editor is going to want to publish and a person's going mm-hmm. to want to read is going to involve a lot of like coloring in and scanning and like, second guessing and and stuff and that's going to be really boring and I'm going to drag it out because I'm not going to want to do it and it's going to take me two years or something. I always felt like the, the most in, sort of enjoyable part of writing is is connecting the dots. Yeah, exactly. You know, of just having all these sort of like seemingly like disparate ideas and finding the through line between them. I think that's what is missing when you make comics. Mm. I think comics is too slow to feel like you're doing that. The writing can feel like that, but the yeah. drawing doesn't necessarily yeah. feel that way. And I think that's what I love about Nabokov. I think he connects dots a yeah. lot instead yeah. of, I think his dots are far apart and he connects them. Are, are you able to sort of get it to a point though where it feels like meditative where you can almost just sort of like zone out during the drawing process? Yeah, I listen to books on tape and podcasts all the time. So when there's something good, it's great. But you can have too much of that mindlessness. Yeah. I think, but I do think I'm getting more comfortable with the craft of comics and I'm getting faster and I'm learning what's busy, what's unnecessary and what's necessary. So I think I'm going to spend more time doing the fun stuff on the next book than I did on the last book. You're already committed to the next book? Yeah. The next book's going to be in a collection of Instagram drawings, but the book after that, I'm committed to it, although I'm trying to change it from what I, what I told the editor it would be, whose name is Andy Ward. He's not just an, mm-hmm. I don't know, I, f- I think it's rude to it's call someone the head. editor. Yeah. yeah. Do you need an editor who just at some point needs to be like, Liana, just commit to this thing? <laughs> like, just, just do this thing? No, the book, the like kind of like before when I thought an editor understands an adaptation better that the thing that we talked about was an adaptation yeah. and that's why I was able to sell it before I made any of it um, but now I'm I'm trying to make some of it into fiction and I'm going to see if he likes it There you go, those are friend Liana Fink her new book Passing for Human is out now on Penguin Random House thanks so much to her for taking the time to do that thanks to you guys as always for listening to the program if you like the show there are a number of ways to support us you can rate and review us on iTunes Google Play we're on Spotify and YouTube now anywhere where you happen to get your podcasts if you have any feedback it's rlcast at gmail.com follow us on Tumblr that's rylcast.tumblr.com that is the first and best place to get all of your R-I-Y-L related information you can like us on Facebook and that's about all we got for this week so stick around around because we are going to be back just about this time next week with another episode of R.I.Y.L. 